Nearly 30 years ago, Tom Hanks fell in love with a mermaid on screen. In what was only his second film, his performance in Ron Howard's Splash was warm, charming, with self-deprecating wit and humour. The characteristics that would make Hanks one of Hollywood's most successful stars. The very first job I had, which was in Splash, was with, with Ron Howard. Um, we, I had been doing a comedy television series and uh, got fired from it, went off the air, and I was desperate, you know, to be funny again, quite frankly. And the very first read-through of the, of the script, of the screenplay, had all the actors and John Candy and Daryl Hannah and Eugene Levy, everybody was there, all the key department heads, and I was operating from the task that had been mine when I was on the TV show, which was to score, which was to kill which was to take the lines and get laughs at the table. And I did it, you know, like flop sweat mercilessly trying to get laughs around this table. And it was terrible, and I didn't get any laughs, and I felt like I had failed. And Ron took me aside that day, right after that reading, and he said, look, I know what you're doing, because I've done things. You want, you're trying to be funny. You're trying to score. That's not your job in this movie. Your job is to love that girl. And if he hadn't said that, you know, he could have all said, hey, he could have fired me that day, to tell you the truth. But he had done TV, and so he, he knew what uh, the things I had fallen into. So he cut me some slack. God bless the boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, along comes Sleepless in Seattle. Nora Ephron, who wrote that with her sister Delia, she, you know, she landed on this concept of hearing somebody's voice on the radio. The fact that they never m see each other and they don't really know who each other are, that was the structure of a screenplay and, and the filmmaker. Um, and the conversations I brought to, I was very, I was probably very cranky with Nora at the beginning of that because I kept reading and said, ah, it's this, it's this kid, that's a kid, that's a kid. He's got a kid, it's a kid scene. The kid's the guy, the kid's the catalyst. It's just a kid, yeah, it's a kid's movie. Um, and she said, no, you have to be a dad. And then I said, well, then you have to write it like a dad. <laughs> uh, which I'm making a joke, but actually sometimes we did come down to words like that. And she says, what do you mean? I said, you're a woman, you're a mother, you're basing this on your experience with your boys. I'm a man. I, my, my relationship with my boys is nothing like this. Uh, for example, she, she, she wrote a scene where um, uh, Sam was going to go off for a romantic weekend with this other woman that Jonah didn't like her. And so he was trying to, he didn't want it, so he was throwing a fit. And in the screenplay, um, Sam, the father, did not go because he didn't want to disappoint his son. And that was in the screenplay. And I, I told Nora, I said, that is such horse shit. <laughs> Let me get this straight. A man has not gotten laid in four years? <laughs> and he's got a shot to get laid this weekend? And he's not going to go because his son doesn't like the girl? <laughs> I got news for you. That kid's going to the sitter, and I'm going off to get laid. <laughs> and that same year, you made Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, yeah, boy, we're blowing is... through this career pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How radical was it to play here's, a gay lawyer? Here's what age? was radical about it, is that when the movie came out and it had all the attention that any studio marketing team could muster that it had, you know, we did all the right interviews and it had all the right features, it came out and it was, uh, it was, it entered into the national zeitgeist literally a third and a third and a third. A third of the reaction was, this is a groundbreaking movie. A third of the reaction was, this is nothing but a tepid pot boiler that doesn't really touch upon the subject that it pretends to touch upon. And a third said, was from essentially uh, 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 the, uh, the gay segment of the world, that said, this movie has nothing to do with us and what we have been facing. And for three weeks, the first week it came out, and then it was forgotten the second week, but it was still playing. And the third week, um, the great uh, 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 gay activist, Larry Kramer, who I have since met and talked to about this very thing, he wrote the most devastating negative article that said, um, uh, why I hate Philadelphia. I mean, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't loaded with vitriol. It was just his opinion, and it was so strong that overnight <laughs> we became controversial. And everybody then had to go and see the, well, not everybody, but enough people had to go in and see the movie 
and weigh in what we thought of, and that actually brought in a ton of those very Americans who thought, I don't know anybody who's gay and, and AIDS hasn't touched my life. So an Academy Award for Philadelphia followed the next year by another Academy yeah, Award yeah, yeah. for Forrest Gump. So how did you settle on Forrest Gump, on the stance, the voice, oh, the whole kind of uh, bearing? In casting of the young Forrest had a particular dilemma in which Bob says, what, what do you think we should do? And we talked about it for a while, and there were a number of, you know, it's a, it's a hard role to cast. I said, Bob, you will never get a kid in order to recreate something that I come up with, you know, theoretically. What has to happen here, I think, is you've got to cast a kid, and then I follow where that kid goes. And young Michael Humphreys came from this part of Tennessee. He had this way of speaking. Uh, that I, I would engage him in conversations with a, with a tape recorder um, and just get this weird kind of cadence that it, uh, we were riding out to see the house that they had built, the set of the, of the Gump house, which is not a real house. And we were just in the car, and I was saying, so, 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 so Michael, uh, uh, what, what, is, what does your father do? And Michael said, my, my, my dad makes grease. <laughs> And I said, how do you make grease? He said, I don't know, but they use it in lipstick <laughs> and modal. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's interesting. Well, um, he, and then he, says, he said to me, can I tell you what my favorite movie of yours is? I said, sure, what is it? Well, I like all of your films, but my favorite is Dragonette. <laughs> Next, you worked with Steven Spielberg. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, God, And yeah. so this is the beginning of, actually, I mean, you worked with Steven yeah. Spielberg on a number of occasions, but this is Saving Private Ryan. When Saving Private Ryan came around, and the script was very much completely in flux, um, and when Steven takes over a script, that's really just a blueprint for the movie that, that he's going to make, particularly with as much visual cinematic elements to it as that, that I knew about it, and desperately wanted to be involved, and when Stephen called me and said, hey, look, um, I, 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 there's a script called Saving Private Ryan, I, I know, I almost said like that. Like that. And we, we talked about it, and I said, look, with your abilities and, and in motion picture, the science of making movies now, you, we, you, we, uh, <laughs> could really <laughs> blow the lid off of what everybody's concept of the World War II movie. It will no longer just be a caper movie or a genre movie. You, you'll be able to address, you know, so many specifics that it will be a tactile experience for the audience as opposed to an intellectual one or, a, you know, a stroll through history. And that's, you know, Stephen did that in spades in the course of the movie. And it was, it was, um, it was an experience, man. I can, I can only tell you. We are moving towards uh, a couple of real characters you play. One is Walt Disney. You have to be very careful. There are things about the reputation of Walt Disney because he's no, quite a controversial No, no, actually, um, uh, the, 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 we wanted to, and the problem was in the current uh, atmosphere of pressure in films, like, for example, Walt Disney died of lung cancer. He smoked three packs a day. Can we show him smoking in a, in a major motion picture these days? No way in hell. So we had, we had a scene in, in, in which um, now in the, in the film, you see me putting it out. So you don't actually see it lit in my hand, but you see the definitive putting out of a cigarette. And, he, and I, I think Walt even says, you know, I don't want everybody to see me smoking because I don't want anybody to get, you know, pick up bad habits, which was true. Uh, he didn't want anybody outside his, you know, the world of Walt Disney to see him smoking. Saving uh, Mr. Banks is a great hymn to traditional filmmaking, if you like. Yeah, and yeah, It's yeah, made yeah. in a kind of rather lovely retro traditional it's on filmmaking. It's set and it's on film. Yeah. And, uh, yes, there's it, it real is. horses in it. So uh, it, could not be, <laughs> it could not be more different in that sense from um, Captain Phillips, which is so much in the moment, that kind of immersive oh, yeah, yeah. storytelling. I mean, you're talking about working with Spielberg and what you wanted to do um, with um, Saving Private Ryan, but in a sense, this, this is even taking this even one step further, isn't it? Putting you right inside the experience for the duration yeah. of the film. There's almost, there's a tiny bit of preamble, and then you are absolutely in it. Then. Yeah, that, that, that's Paul.
Paul did things like, in this film, we did not meet the Somali actors. And then the day came where we shot the, the hijacking and they came on board the bridge. We had never met them. They came roaring on, loaded for bear, pumped up, their veins sticking out, their teeth scared. They were the skinniest, scariest human beings we'd ever seen. And there was, a, there was bona fide hair standing up on the back of your neck. Fear, for the better part of 40 minutes, you know, four, you know, four or five takes, in which everybody just re-geared up. And then we, you know, we had 15 minutes in order to figure out what we were going to do next. Then we finally said, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. <laughs> and, and what did Barkat Abdi say to me? Oh, I can't believe I'm making a film with Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much we for have your lucky pictures. We have. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too fast or too much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.